of the 2017 SoCal Harvest Cup. Really excited to have you all here. Uh, my name is Mike Janakis. I'm the editor in chief of High Times Magazine, and um, we have a great uh, selection of seminars today. We hope you'll stick around for all of them. But this first one, we're really excited about. As I'm sure all of you know at this point, uh, California has legalized recreational pot. Now that's great, and it's going to be uh, coming in July of 2018. But a lot of people still have questions about what exactly uh, that entails. So fortunately, we have two experts here to tell you all about it. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the moderator, and she's going to take you through uh, the rest of the seminar and maybe answer some questions at the end. So um, please give a very warm welcome to a marijuana investment specialist, Nicole West. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for coming out today. Um, I just give a brief little intro about myself uh, as to why I kind of get a little bit of clout to ask all these questions up here. Um, I've been in the industry a little over 10 years now. Um, I was one of the original license holders in the city of Long Beach uh, when Long Beach originally licensed back in 2009, which seems like forever ago. Uh, I also have worked for Weed Maps uh, and Marijuana.com. I worked uh, with them here in California as well as out in Colorado. We got relocated out there and I've been a part of development as well as overseeing and operations and sales for a little over $250 million worth of legal sales in the state of Colorado over the past five years. Uh, now I'm doing private consulting for a lot of businesses out here in California. I just moved back. It's very exciting to be home. Um, I kind of consider myself a marijuana refugee. Uh, I moved away to Colorado so I didn't go to jail and didn't end up embarrassing my, uh, my grandma. Um, but now it's time to be back and grandma's really actually kind of excited to see me, uh, know, knowing very well what I do this time. Uh, so we're back and very excited to be able to be a part of what's going on here in California. Um, I've got you know a lot of questions and this is actually kind of an exciting moment for me uh, because here we have a marijuana lawyer um, and I decided that I was going to present this as a bit of free legal consultation if you will for everyone. Um, this has kind of always been my joke when I teach. Uh, usually a lawyer goes up before and does a legal seminar portion of it and I do the operation side of things, development, sales. I do oversee a lot of compliance as well. Uh, but with that, I always feel that it's very neat to be able to have a lawyer to ask the questions to because this is, you know, probably the most, the most sought after position. At, right after you get your right real estate agent, this is the next thing that you need to make sure that you got just perfectly is a great marijuana attorney. Um, and so I'm basically going to present this panel um, with Stefan here, and I'm going to present this as if I'm his client, and I just have some questions moving forward um, of how I'm going to make my way into the state of California. Um, and, you know, there's going to be some times where he's going to have the answer of really go ask your own attorney of that, because if you guys are familiar at all with what's happening right now, not everything is black and white, okay? Not everything there's going to be a solid answer for, and I'd say, more often than not, at this point right now, there's more questions than there are answers. But I'm just gonna kinda let you understand some of the big questions that you need to ask, and maybe he doesn't have uh, the answer right now, but these are things that you probably should put into your Rolodex of questions when you do decide to go sit down with your lawyers. Um, and so here we have Stefan uh, Borsensula. Uh, he is a lawyer, you do have your own practice, correct? Yep. And he's also working for Hoban Law, which is a large marijuana law firm uh, in Colorado. So they do have branches out outside of the Los Angeles, Long Beach area um, that he can network you out with. If say maybe Los Angeles is not your area that you're looking at, he has a huge network of legal advisors throughout the United States, all um, specializing in everything from criminal defense all the way up to uh, marijuana law specifically. Um, so if you could just give us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, it was funny, Nicole and I were catching up about our shared city of Long Beach. Uh, that's kind of where I came out of first. I was a Long Beach uh, attorney and political person there um, who also just happened to like marijuana. And when all uh, the shenanigans that took place starting in 2000, and when I moved there in 2010, it was kind of a nice time. But then by the time I was done with law school in 2013, we decided to reban. Uh, all commercial activities in Long Beach, and I, as a consumer, woke up one day and realized that the thing that had got me through law school was now gone. Uh, all our doors were closed. All of them. <laughs> and so, once I just happened to be working at the time for the now mayor of Long Beach, Rob Garcia, and I took that as an opportunity to uh, kind of work on the 
inside to see if we can get some sort of uh, better recognition of the stores that had, at least in my neighborhood, never caused any particular problem or you know, anybody had a particular issue with them. And, uh, we're, you know, as we speak, as say here right now, uh, a year removed from the passage of Measure MM, we have, I believe, two, maybe three open stores right now in the city. Two, I believe. Two connected, connected on Second Street, which I, you know, worked at. Uh, it's gorgeous. Me. It is really nice, and we got a pass. It's funny if uh, anybody's aware of Long Beach, you know that uh, we had a one of the probably most active and uh, most articulate opponents to uh, legalized cannabis. Uh, a, in the third district of Long Beach, she was a she is an Orange County district attorney, uh, and killed our plants about two or three times before we finally got it passed through on a citizens initiative. And the first store to open up was right in her district. And when she read the security plan that I have that we that I helped write, she established. She said, "This is a gold standard for the community. We are now, and I can say this, we are now that building is more secure than the banks on the same street. You know, we're gonna the, the residents are gonna love us." Um, but you know, at the same time, we also have an entirely uncapped uh, market for non-retail, and that was something that you know didn't come was passed through again with 60% of the citizens behind it. So it was a really long, hard-fought fight at the local level, and I think that it kind of gives a good example of what to expect from the state the statewide for the next year or two. So not only did you have uh, a legal standpoint from him, you do have an understanding as well from the inside, um, the way that a government like Long Beach specifically, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the city of Long Beach, but it's it's a big little city, if, if that makes any sense. It's got a lot of people, there's a downtown, there's a, a harbor, but it's still a very small town in the way that the government runs on, on a day to day. So it's uh, very interesting to watch Long Beach roll out their laws. I mean. Long Beach was the first in the state of California back when I was licensed years and years ago to actually have a full licensing process for marijuana. I mean, they were far beyond their, ahead of their time at that point, and which is why the, the state ended up deeming three portions of that ordinance unconstitutional uh, and made it to the state Supreme Court. And rather than rewrite those pieces of the ordinance, the city got scared, so they overturned the entire ordinance altogether, thus making us all criminals overnight. Um, I have 97 marijuana violations on my record. Uh, they are all zoning violations because the city had given laws, so I couldn't actually receive any misdemeanors unless I didn't pay the, the tickets, but they were zoning violations, so they were based on the code of the building rather than actually being in trouble for selling marijuana, I was in trouble for selling marijuana in the wrong place. Uh, so I just have some questions I think are you know, kind of on everyone's mind that I feel like we, we want to know. And I'm going to start with something very obvious. We're, we're here, we're at the fairgrounds, which is safe, right? But come 2018, um, there is a way for public events with marijuana. Uh, but it does have to be currently, as the statute states, uh, in, in a fairgrounds, correct? I believe, I believe so. It's been one of those things, public use and consumption is one of those things that is not entirely clarified at the, at the state level yet. Um, my understanding at the local level though is again, this is something that uh, can be created as an acceptable use. You were just talking about receiving fines. So anybody talking about local licensing, remember, we're not, you, your state is what's going to be giving your license to operate. Your permit is at the local level in order to be what you're able to do on your piece of land. Um, so, nothing I believe is stopping, for example, San Bernardino, where we're sitting right now in the city of San Bernardino, for example, from saying and passing an ordinance saying, in this area, if someone wanted to come in for High Times Magazine and whomever and carry on this sort of on-site consumption event, they can be able to do so according to these particular standards, just like you would for you know, the tire shop across the street or something. Um, I know that a couple of different jurisdictions are also actively looking into this. Uh, some, this is something, again, that would be qual I would think would probably fall more under the adult use or a license category if we're going to be thinking about it from the perception of SB 4, uh, 94. Um, purely because even though you know, everybody here today brought forth their medical recommendation um, because we're committed you know, consumers to this particular product, most of the municipalities are looking to uh, get tax revenue from tourism. And I think they're going to be looking at the Colorado example where every single um, uh, hotel or restaurant, because of existing you know, 20 years now of anti-tobacco ordinances, it just says, are absolutely not, are we going to open up the door again to smoking inside of you know, bars, restaurants, 
you know, hotel rooms, anything like that. You know, it's just logical. They're not going to try to open up that can of worms again. So they it effectively banned all public consumption. And so unless you were, unless your residents were you know, had a your residents were, who had property were the only ones able to consume at that point. So that, that falls under the Clean Air Act, correct? Exactly. So it's one of those existing kind of conflicts with laws that doesn't was never intended to be applied to be applied to cannabis is now going to be a kind of a problem. Um, but there are a couple places that have you know they're already looking ahead to to this. I know West Hollywood, for example, you know, again on, always on the precipice of new new progressive legislation is looking into something that would allow for some sort of adult use, you know, adult use social consumption being the, you know, the operative terminology to look there, uh, happening at the, you know, with it is probably within their bar scene, I would imagine. Um, Tuesday, again, not to make this too Long Beach centric, but, you know, it's an entirely random that we're here today. And uh, Tuesday, the city council, after all these years, is going to quietly take up in Long Beach uh, the issue of possibly uh, putting forth an ordinance at a later time for adult use consumption. And given again our existing kind of retail, uh, restaurant retail heavy uh, city planning, I would imagine that we would, it's at least something that they would consider. Um, but beyond that, yeah, there are a lot of places all across California because of all these bans. Uh, you see it in Kern County here in San Bernardino County, I mean, pretty much anywhere where uh, where they've had these sort of large gatherings and Prop 215 compliant um, places. They they don't they, these are you know more or less rural, area, rural conservative areas that don't want a permanent establishment of, uh, of retail outlets, but they'll surely take our money to come in here once or twice a year, you know? And so I don't, I don't see them stopping that because frankly, we're one of the few vendors to be able to support these sorts of locations over and over again. And we've been, we're a lot safer than, we're a lot, we cause far fewer public problems and, than uh, any of the alcohol or tastings or anything like that that go on. Absolutely, and it's very interesting right now the way the law um, is stating for the state uh, that if we did have any, as it stands now, public consumption events, they would have to be on fairgrounds, which I think is kind of interesting being as we're trying to keep this away from children in my mind, and if anyone, like if you think of a fair, right, you think of like a Ferris wheel and like a giant thing of cotton candy and like a petting zoo or something, like that's what I think of when I think fair. So I think it's very interesting that the state would say, okay, but only consume on the fairgrounds when it's an adults only fair night or something. Um, so I, I just think the, the public events is gonna be a very interesting uh, future. I mean, the way that, the way that we're able to, to exist under a Prop 215 will be very different um, as far as any of the booths are concerned. Um, I think it's going to be a very interesting year next year for us to see, especially at a High Times event in Southern California, how that will pan out, uh, big picture. Um, and then as far as my next question, this is always uh, a very interesting one in California in general, uh, packaging, right? Okay, so I look, I've, I've worked and I've expanded now uh, in seven states, uh, full, full compliant businesses in retail. Uh, Washington has no regulation for the child proofing. So they're, they're waste, and although everything does have to be pre-packaged, right? So it shows up, it's pre-packaged, you can't open it, it has to leave that way. No, no open containers in Washington whatsoever. You can't open your jar and smell it, okay? It has to come from the grow, from the facility to your store in the container, okay? So, but it has to be tamper evident. Uh, they have much less waste at a, in a situation like that than in Colorado, where in Colorado it doesn't have to come prepackaged, but it has to leave child resistant, resealable, opaque, all of these additional uh, requirements. And I don't know if any of you have ever worked in, in packaging, uh, but it is, it is not that simple. Um, and now when we start to talk about child resistant, child resistant resealable, so now we can put it back together, and it needs to be opaque. A lot of times you'll only be able to receive one in one package and one in another, and you'll find people getting their opaque package and putting it in to a child resistant thing, or vice versa, you know, getting a child resistant thing and putting, putting the opaque package um, on the outside of it so that it's child resistant and you can't see in it. Um, but the ability to do all of that ends up creating a, a quite a bit of waste. 
Um, so when we, you know, when you look at a, a dispensary in Colorado, you'll very often see like the recycle box at the end because you've got the bag and you've got the bottle and you've got the thing that went inside of that. So there's so much plastic being wasted along the way. In California, uh, any of you guys who live here know the bag situation has become um, a very serious issue in, in different cities and counties. And Long Beach, for instance, was one of the first ones to outlaw bags. Um, all together at you know a grocery store level. So I'm very curious. How do you think California is going to treat the packaging situation and walk that line between being environmentally conscious and concerned in a, in a conservative way for child resistance? Yeah. So I mean, this is a. It's funny. I think it's um, honestly. I think at least at the outset, you're going to be seeing the worst of all worlds. Um, there's going to be a tendency to overregulate and to do more than is what's necessary. If just because again, and I think you know, there's a fair amount of good reason for that. We, you know, we're going to be under the microscope of the Department of Justice, and the entire reason to address for us existing is based on those Attorney General guidelines in the Cole memo are going to already be scrutinized in every single part, in every single way by the uh, by Attorney General said Jeff Sessions. Therefore, I think that there is going to be a tendency at the legislative level to feel that we have to overcompensate for that within our legal stores. And so at least within the first couple of years, I would imagine, because I'm already hearing this from local planning departments who have been visiting, especially Colorado, I think. Interesting, I'm not hearing as much from Washington or Oregon, even though those were passed more recently. It's been Colorado has been seen as the gold standard for whatever reason, uh, you know, for, for the uh, overregulation of this. And what that, I think that that's gonna translate to is, yeah, you're gonna be, for the first couple of years, leaving um, or at least after the first audit, when they get corrected from whatever they're doing right now, you're going to be seeing people walking out of there with holding just vials of plastic that are going to be containing relatively few amounts of actual pro usable product, purely because there's going to, they're going to be throwing the book at, the, at these businesses, and they're going to say, yes, they, all, they have to be child resistant, and they have to be uh, uh, tamper proof, and they have to be opaque, and this, because remember, the local, locally, they can, they can apply any sorts of Standards on top of whatever the state does. So the state's obviously going to be, you know, mandating this without, very, with very little local input, and then the locality is going to feel a need to, you know, heap on some extra stuff to make to tell the residents that, you know, this is still not a, this is not going to be a problem for them. So yeah, you're going to see a. a uh, so we think a lot of packaging in California. Of pack yeah, so California's going to say basically maybe not so much for the environment this round. Exactly. I, I can actually tell you, I was just at it was in the departmental. Uh, clearance for a client in Long Beach who's going forward with a retail establishment, and we had to explain to them. And in fact, this is a, probably a good lesson. Advocate for yourself because the, the regulations at the local level are being shaped a lot of the time, and if you do have this opportunity, push back. They say, well, we want everything to be packaged at the distribution center and come in ready to be sold, essentially, so the retail center, no one in the store is breaking down, breaking down product, weighing it locally, putting it in, anything like that. It's coming from you know, in this particular area, it's eight, you did have you know how sad it is you can't smell the jar. That you can't I'm smell sorry, the jar man. It just that. bummed me out so bad in Washington. I was just like, wait, what? And then we got out to the car, and there was a hair in one of our jars. And then I walked back in, and they said, can I exchange this? And said, no, you opened it. You can't. And so I had to take my hair jar and go. And they're, I was they're, bummed. <laughs> in this case, we actually had to explain to them and say, look, by not allowing and by making up this regulation again that's not specified anywhere in the law, but deciding that you're just going to do it, by saying that you have to provide, you know, uh, ready to sell units from processing, traveling it, you know, on the highways for however long into the point where it's actually going to be sold, we had to tell them, no, that's going to promote the growth of mold. And <laughs> that's actually a bad thing for the consumer, especially from a medical standpoint. They had no idea. They thought that they were being overly zealous in terms of protecting the public. We have to tell them, no, that's not, that they're doing the exact opposite. So these sorts of discussions are going on. And again, every single step, be polite. You know, you do know more if you've been operating even for a couple of years, more than anybody in the city attorney's office, city manager's office, any of these places. And Don't expect them to know what you're talking do, about either. Oh my gosh. So explain to them. If you're doing something, if, a, if something that you've been doing in the gray market for years to avoid detection and avoid uh, uh, civil suits from, from hurting anybody and you know make it profitable at the same time, and you're still here after years of doing that, 
then you actually have something to educate your city, your city on in terms of best practices. And use that terminology to explain, no, no, we do this in this particular way because we make sure that it, because it actually helps the consumer in the end. You know, and it's something that we want to translate from the gray market into the black market, into the you know, now accepted legal market. And if you can put it in writing, it's going to be a lot better. So any of the things that you do in your business, so if you have any operating procedures that you see as being something that's going to be very valuable moving forward, put it in writing. Put it in writing with reasons as to why, because if you can present that, there's a lot of times that your presentation of an educational side view of why you do something can create a new law. And it's amazing how many people I've seen present an idea and it changed the city's opinion to the point of where that that is the new way of things. That's the new standard. Again, because they're not aware of a lot of the things that we're dealing with. They don't understand. I mean, and once we do get into law, be prepared to stick sometimes and pivot sometimes because it's going to be changing so fast that you know, you're going to have to be flexible in it. Um, but yeah, so packaging, I think it's going to be very interesting uh, to see California roll out. And I, I, kind of, I kind of assumed that they'd go a little overzealous, but then I was thinking about how serious they are about the environmental side of things with the bags. And, you know, maybe, so maybe this is one of the things where you're going to have to start paying for packaging uh, to make sure that we get it, uh, that it covered. You know, we pay for the plastic bags at the grocery store, 10 cents. Work it out, you know, one of the things that you'll see, think about it holistically as well, in these applications at the local local and state level, but especially at the local level, I'm seeing that they already are requiring uh, re even retailers to consider environmental impact and what they're gonna be doing. And mention on the offset that, look, this packaging issue that you're already creating is gonna require us to deal with some sort of uh, recycling issue, you know, just so that when, you're, when you do have to prove it, do it, you know, it's not gonna be a surprise at all. All right, so my next question is a, a very heated one. Um, I'm interested to see uh, everyone who uh, is watching the laws progress. Um, you're probably very aware that the state of California has required uh, labor peace agreements for marijuana businesses, okay? So a labor peace agreement is an agreement with a union that says that if your employees do decide to go union, and union, unionization is 50% plus one person, um, if 50% plus one people in your company want to go union, you cannot stop that. And you have to go in to your licensing with an agreement stating that you've already negotiated with the union that you would align with them if this happens, right? Uh, so I'm very curious to see. My question to you is how long do you see it before marijuana is much like grocery stores in California with unionization? Hopefully, right on the offset. I'd say 35 days. I'd say if yeah. you're not already equating for marijuana, uh, for labor wages, which um, union minimum wage in California is $16. So the lowest wage that you should be offering your staff would be $16. Because if you're not offering them at the very least union wages, there's no reason that it won't happen tomorrow because all they have to do is say, I want union wages. So if you start every one of your employees, at twelve, thirteen dollars an hour. What's minimum wage here? Ten. Minimum wage is going to be raised progressively in California. What is it right now? Uh, uh, boy. Uh, Ten. I think it might be up to twelve. Different counties. Or like different. But what's the lowest? So it's like ten something. Ten. It's going to be fifteen, I believe, by the next year. But, so um, then I would imagine that that the union minimum wage would go up as well because it's a. But it's, the, the union wages are actually are they're good. I mean, not to not to contradict, but I think that they're usually or they come into an agreement through the contract process. Yeah. And so, I, and I think that's an instructive thing to know as well is that yes, you won't be able to stop the, the your employees from by signing this good deal from set from, you know from unionizing. But it doesn't mean that you're giving up necessary leverage within the per as an employer uh, with it through the, the contracting process. It just means essentially that, that you're at a, you know, for compared to every other employer in the, in the country, you are at a uh, more even keel with your employees during that negotiating process. Now, specifically, you know, I think it, I'm not. I'm a come from a very pro union ba pro union and pro labor background compared to a lot of the operators. And that's a an exact. That's why you know you once you once your employer once you're accepted into the the protection of the union and you of a unionized workforce, um, you're going to find it a lot easier to be able to negotiate your uh, future uh, regulations and pro business laws 
uh, purely because you're going to have a workforce that's going to show up to every single one of these city council meetings wearing your company t-shirt, wearing the UFCW or Teamsters t-shirt. I don't know if you guys are familiar with UFCW, but you absolutely should be. They've been implementing laws in cities and counties around California more progressively than any of the organizations that we've had in marijuana over the past five years. The UFCW, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, uh, they already are willing to, once you go union with their business, they have banking. Uh, the union, if you are unionized, they will allow you to bank at their credit union, uh, which is very exciting because I'm sure you'll want to be able to put your money somewhere, right? Um, and and I, I honestly, I'm, I'm very pro-union too. I'm from Long Beach as well. Um, and in my opinion of the way that these businesses have progressed so quickly, I think it's very valuable to the fact that the union takes care of a lot of the things that we as marijuana business holders don't necessarily want to have to. Um, you know, union does really help as far as like streamlining, HR, payroll, all of the things that you normally would have to handle. Um, you know, on, on that, there, so there are there are upsides, but I and you pay lobbyists like myself a lot less money over time because you yes. have an internal political a political machine built into those unions that far exceeds any particular private lobbyist. You know, they they. Uh, they're able to run ballot initiatives. They're able to talk to established, especially democratic machines in certain dense urban, dense urban areas. So you're you're becoming an ally with them on the outset is going to be a positive thing for your business in the long run, which I know is counterintuitive to a lot of the way that people are brought up with thinking about unionization. But this is, I mean, this is one of the, the demonstrably demonstrably huge exceptions to that. If you are in Agland or anywhere near a harbor, you will be union within months at the very most. And I'm just giving that as a forewarning and an understanding of, of the future of this because that's just gonna be the progression of it. Once one of the businesses, and this is kind of you know the biggest thing is you get a few of the major players to go union, their employees go union, and now their employees are within that network and they wanna be represented as such. And it's unfortunate, but there's been, you know, years and years and years of people, I mean, it's a, it was a piece of this culture um, of getting paid for your work in exchange for stuff. Um, and whether or not you realize that a lot of times that's uh, a, an abusive method because a lot of times you're not getting what your, your worth of your wages. Sometimes it's a great way and you're getting double if you're out there, you know, but at the same time you're, you're not able to maintain or, you know, be able to say that you have health insurance for that matter. Um, but I just I think it's going to be very interesting, and just I want to make sure everyone's very aware of the fact that the union is going to be a very big part of what's happening in California. And if you watch very closely as the cities that are developing, you're going to see the involvement very, very real with the unions being a huge player in why cities that were once moratorium and things are now actually going to allow for licensing because the unions have some of the biggest lobbying efforts in, in the United States for that matter. Um, I got a, I got a fun question. For you guys, CEO, what is what is that is that a thing still? Like, are people? I mean, I hate to make light of this, but it's so up in the air. Um, one day, it's like this is the answer, and this is the holy bible. You want this pre ICO license? Give me fifteen million dollars, and now it's like well, you might just have a piece of paper. My, my personal opinion, having been one of the people that actually helped found the uh, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Task Force, which was a group of uh, delivery services who bonded together to be able to try to help preserve their, you know, operating standards in a dense, you know, the, de the densest, uh, biggest commercial, uh, cannabis commercial area in the country. Um, I don't think that there's a simple way to be able to answer what's going to how, how the Los Angeles market is going to is going to come out. Again, as someone in the South Bay with a relative who has now worked to help create a more regulated working environment, we're happy to take advantage of the confusion city of Los Angeles. Long um, Beach is raking it in right now because everyone's like, well, at least they understand what they're doing. I mean, Los Angeles County in that manner is going to be coming up on that time, you know, yeah. because of the presence of a of Janice Hahn, you know, office as a refuge from the miasma that is the Los Angeles City Council. You know, she's now a couple of years removed from the, from the 2007 battles, you know, that determined the pre, you know, who, which gave way to the, what we now know as pre-ICO. Uh, I mean, granted, and this is one of those questions, obviously, that is asked your own. If you are interested in the Los Angeles market, the consult your own, uh, obviously, it's like anything else, but specifically consult an attorney on this particular matter just because um, anybody looking to acquire uh, the 
businesses that have been currently operating here in the city of Los Angeles or that expect to have some sort of affirmative recognition from the city of Los Angeles, you're going to have to do a lot of due diligence just to be able to make sure that those are that they're, what they're representing is actually true. Um, and that's not even just taking into account whether or not, if they are telling you everything that's the truth, that that is even going to matter in a couple of months given the kind of top of the air nature that's been going with that city. I will just say this, I don't think that the, that the current uh, you know, orientation of where that city is going really represents what the consumers want. I think it's been each, it's a really bad, you, if you want to say about Long Beach being a success story in Los Angeles, meanwhile, is a, uh, it's a cautionary tale about how uh, effective lobbying from the other side, from the prohibitionist side, can help to you know, divide and conquer every single tiny you know, facet of the industry to the point where you know, delivery services versus standard oil and retail um, indoor cultivators versus manufacturers. All those folks are now, you know, internally fighting, internally fighting amongst themselves instead of working all on the same page for Team Wheat. And once you do that, that's actually actually that's how you pass change. You know, if you're other than that, the city councilors have it, or in that case, or board supervisors, or whoever you're dealing with, if you're not, if all of them, are, you know, the cannabis folks are not on the same page, it gives them an excuse to ignore you completely. They don't want to get into the you know, the, the, the details of esoteric weed politics. They wanted to just- That's why it didn't pass the first time, because there was two different laws. And so half the people were standing on one side, and half the people were standing on another side. And we were not unified in, in a law change. And now there's six different groups that you can, you know, that, have, that are openly, you know, supposedly working together, but you never know. All right, so I have one, uh, one other question that I wanted to ask specifically to uh, 64 uh, in regards to the veterans. Um, there is a, a big um, movement right now of the, the moratoriums happening, so access is being restricted in certain areas. Um, I will be very candid and say that I have been told that it's partially my fault because I campaigned for 64. <laughs> Uh, by my friends, I, I've been I've been a, a very a active member of uh, the Weed for Warriors organization as a civilian, and uh, they stole a box of my Amendment 64 T-shirts and burned them. Uh, <laughs> that's for real, uh, and they're my friends. Um, and they told me that you know I was you know I had progressively pushed towards taking away access, um, and that they're you know in, in talks right now. I'm trying to get. Um, you know, more more uh, press on this for the state. Now, how much do you think is this gonna happen before it gets better? Like how many counties, there's 58 counties in the state of California. How many counties do you see moratorium, uh, putting a moratorium on retail establishments? You say 50%, 20%, what do you, what do you think? Before it gets better. Before it gets better, I mean, we're already past the point where the, the worst possible scenario, I believe, because right after the passage of the FCRSA in 2015, you saw the first quarter of 2016, before 64 was ever passed, a massive, uh, because of the, the problem with the FCRSA getting, not having, not getting too much local control on their front end, the entire state was passed an effective moratorium. It gave a really good excuse for all these different jurisdictions to be able to rewrite existing bans that were in place to be able to be more modernized. So 64 was pretty much only confirming an existing problem that was already present. You know, this uh, this larger deal that we had made to be able to, you know, for, to affirmatively provide uh, cities a chance to be able to opt out if they so believe if they so wanted to. And then we were not organized on the front end to be able to blunt that and to be able to make sure that they actually started adopting the laws. Now part of that, I think, was probably because of, you know, genuine and sincere confusion on the, uh, the end of the legislators thinking, well, why would, in 2016 again, why would we want to regulate medical, even if the framework of it is down, if we're just going to be restarting again with adult use in 20, at the end of 2016? And that was the case. And now we're getting to the point where finally we're getting this narrowed down with the, with the passage of the cleanup bill, of the governor's cleanup bill and all these legislation. And we're waiting right now for that final piece of, leg of, re of regulation. Now, you know, all of us know that, that that's just politicians to be able to pushing the envelope as long as they can and kicking it down, kicking the regulatory football down to be able to uh, make it as difficult for the operators to, to open up as possible. But at the same time, you know, these sorts of large rules in a state, in a state as complex as ours do take time to be able to implement. So let's give them a little bit of credit and say that, okay, finally now we at least have the state, the state level rules. 
We have a couple of places with an illegal supply chain that are going to be opening up. If you just look around again in South Bay, Long Beach isn't the only place that's opened up in the last couple of weeks, uh, last couple of months. Linwood, Maywood, Bellflower, all those places now have, have had open application times. Not great times, and I think it's, you know, if you look at all these local applications, there are all sorts of weird rules that they're trying to insert now. But they're coming. They're starting. The, the, the cracks are starting to appear on that uh, on, on little places where you know we're going to have legalized retail. And up north, there's already a healthy supply chain for every other type of, of, of uh, commercial cannabis activity. So we're going to have somewhat of a functioning supply chain, you know, slowly integrating itself in. Um, but you know, the instead of opining about mistakes that were made in the past, you know, strategically, and I think there is a case to be able to make by saying that, you know, not trying to trying to. Uh, Get onto the ballot in 2016 versus 2012 with the adult use thing was probably not the best thing. You know, we should have just regulated, you know, medical and kept in the opt-in, the opt-in, you know, quasi quasi medical system that we've preserved the last 20 years. But we're here now. Now, if they're outlawing a retail establishment, uh, moratorium um, retail establishment in that city or county, is that that stopping a delivery sir, uh, a dispensary from bordering city driving into that city? That's a specific legal question that I would need to look into the city. Right. That's because, worth a question, right? Yeah, it's, just because it's let's, the, find a, let's find a, a city on the border to those spots and let's get Kern County service because the veterans need access to medicine. And the, um, and if, that, if I can, if I can. Let's not, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the best way to preserve access right now is to work, in the, just like everything else in politics, is working at the local level to be able to make your counselors or your, or your board supervisors aware of what's going on. And speak intelligently, be very forceful, but polite, and bring friends. And you will start to see them opening up. Because I've, I've been to plenty of city council, uh, city council meetings. I, and usually I'm the only one there. And I, I used to be the only one there, and then I moved away. I'm back home. It, it's, very, I'll hang out with you now. it's very lonely to go to the city of Temecula or you know the county of Riverside or you know San Bernardino or something, and be the one person saying, "Hi, you know, I'm here promoting regulated cannabis with an open ordinance system. No weird, you know, uh, lotteries. Just a thing where you you know put, get compliant land and then a good buffer zone and put forth your paperwork." And counselors are looking around, very you know. It, very confused because they're they're used to somebody screaming at them. You know, if you come with that sort of approach, you're going to find that you're going to, that these cities are going to be falling a lot faster. But it's just that we really do need to come to these meetings, sign up for counterex, see when they're going to be happening, talk to your lawyer, and get them to be the person who's going to tell you when they're happening. Because that's the only way this is going to open up. That unless any of you guys have to be sitting on you know a couple hundred thousand dollars and want to independently run a ballot initiative and go skip all that process. It's an option. That's an option. It's, it's, one way, it's one way that's been promoting that's been getting the change going through, but it's a very expensive and not very friendly way to be able to introduce yourself to the community. It's much better to be able to convince the board supervisors, the city councilors, the city manager, all those folks. Because at this point we have demonstrable evidence to show that it improves your community. They have you know the tons of tax data from from uh, from states like Colorado with a more regulated system to show the you know, social improvements that can come. So at this point, if they feel like standing in the way of progress, make them aware that there are political consequences for that. There are plenty of consequences for standing in the way of progress at this point, which is very interesting. We're finally getting a little bit of leverage um, in, in our ability to say that you can't stand in our way anymore, which is very neat. Um, I actually have a, a question that strikes very close to home for me, uh, dabs. Um, that's not the question, that's the beginning of it, uh, but I'd like to start my statement with dabs. I'm um, very interested in the extract manufacturing and how that's going to pan out big picture. Um, I think that there's a, a, a bit of a misconception right now that's happening at a city level as to where they're going to allow volatile extraction to happen on a state level. I think a lot of cities are allowing people to get zoned in places that when the state comes in, it's going to be a hot mess oh, yeah. with the codes of, if you don't know what I'm saying, of class one, division one, I highly recommend you write that down, go Google it. Uh, class one, division one, the regulations, uh, fire codes for using volatile extraction methods, anywhere from butane to propane to ethanol. Um, even CO2 now falls under class one, uh, division two regulations, and they do all have NFTP regulations as well. Uh, but I do know that a lot of cities 
have been allowing uh, volatile extraction uh, potential in areas that I do not believe are going to be licensable at a state level due to zoning uh, for the specific type of manufacturing. That's not to say that you won't be able to make cookies or, or candy or maybe even CO2 there because CO2 does have some different regulations uh, due to explosive nature of, of the, uh, the product and the machines that you're using uh, or lack thereof, which is kind of interesting because they're dangerous too. Uh, however, um, under volatile extraction, so ethanol, uh, propane, and butane, a lot of the areas, and you know, I, I have a lot of people that are saying, well, the city is letting me be there. And I say, well, that doesn't necessarily mean anything because the city, again, like he's saying, is giving you a permit, your license to operate and do business is gonna come at a state level. You're gonna be getting zoning permits from a city. You're gonna be able to be getting your business licenses from the city. But your actual authorization to do this for you know, extraction of marijuana, cultivation of marijuana, big picture, is going to come at a state level. Um, so with that, how many extraction facilities do you think right now um, are being opened in a way that will be 100% compliant to the state? Boy, that's a uh, very difficult question to be able to answer. <laughs> Probably very few. I, 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 would, I, I think that's a just, I would just answer that by way of, say, of affirming what you're already kind of implying there, which is, um, you know, make sure that you're, when you're going to these cities, especially when they are opening up and saying, yeah, we're going to allow every single license site because, and I've seen this a lot again. I've seen this at a couple of places that are opening up and deciding to they very enthusiastically decide they're going to license everything without the idea that maybe there is no place in your city or your jurisdiction that should be appropriate for this particular use. And uh, the best way to, that you can make that you protect yourself of that is hiring a uh, somebody with the adequate level of expertise in fire code, in, in dealing with the fire code. I was this is so important. Yeah. Chief Dury Ashen from Long Beach Fire Department appeared on the uh, CCIA panel uh, in Anaheim a couple of months ago and said directly, we want your businesses to come here, just be able to work with us and have somebody on your team who is able to speak our language. And what he means by that is find yourself, you know, when you're coming, if you came to my office right now and said, I have a compliant piece of land in a city that's able to operate, I'm going to say, that's great, I want you to help with an application. I'm gonna say you need to find yourself a, that's great, I'm only a component to what you're gonna be necessary for. You need to hire, hire yourself a licensed architect who's dealt with them in that particular area. You need to hire yourself a security expert who's worked with us, who we've worked with Canada specifically. But now, specifically, if you're dealing with manufacturing, the other thing that you're gonna to have to play out is somebody who has, who is a, has plenty of experience in dealing with the fire code and is able to speak to these, these jurisdictions specifically about you know what their existing building code uh, is and how it's going to translate into the for this particular use. So we've had the, I've had these these exact same conversations about you know what sort of extraction methods going to be able to go to, to be able to happen in the city. You know uh, what sort of are we going to require a thirty foot smokestack to be able to be put in for this? You know is that going to be necessary? I I'm an attorney. I only know what the, I'm on, my job is to be able to look at the existing law and explain it to somebody who doesn't really fully understand it, or say that the law needs to be changed to fit this. I can't understand, I don't know anything about a particular matter beyond just what I'm able to read. So make sure your team has somebody who's able to talk talk to an environmental you know, health uh, expert for the city, or the fire or the fire marshal for that city, and talk fire you know, code with them. And say, no, 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 this, this business is gonna uh, meet existing standards of the building code and not gonna require particular variance, blah, blah, blah. That's going to save you a lot of money and a lot of time in the long run. And make sure, frankly, that you're, again, the state's not going to come in and revoke your permit and say, you yeah, can't actually exist here because of something we decided. Now, I would have to ask my, my uh, the, the $10 million question, which is, when can people who are 21 actually buy some weed? Well, again, my there's a couple of jurisdictions that are very, very, very quietly starting to consider ordinances for adult use. Most I heard that January 1, I could buy it in Santa Ana. That's what they told me when I went to buy some weed the other day at medical. They said that January a, 1. Was that, a, was that a legit, was that a licensed store that's Yeah. That? Well, maybe they, Santa Ana, maybe they know, maybe. maybe they know something we don't in terms of what the, that wonderful city council is going to decide to do on January 1st. Or maybe the people that were there didn't know very much. That's also very good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go with the latter. 
you're gonna uh -huh. find you're gonna find that the, the difference of opinion about um, any of these issues is gonna even challenge is gonna have four or five different shades even on the lawyer again. Um, but yeah, don't uh, with with regards to, to 21, you know, until your city says affirm your city or your county affirmatively says we are gonna allow a license. A a license types, in other words, adult use license types, to be able to have legal uses within our controlling jurisdiction for land use. Um, unfortunately, the only legal way in which you would be able to procure cannabis um, if, without a medical recommendation is if I took one into my pocket as a friend and just handed it to you. Gifting is acceptable. Gifting we can acceptable. gift recreational marijuana as and of January 1. Gift, just for those with black letter law, along with the, you know, one ounce or less. But it also means you received nothing in kind. Nothing. Not a, you know, this Cooperative is Cooperative thought truly, process is not the thing anymore. They, you can truly throw it inside of your stockings at Christmas. You can wrap it up and give it to somebody. You can even give it to a politician, believe it or not. They will have to disclose it on their Form 700 in terms of what its actual lab of value is. It might be nice for you to provide them a receipt. If it, if it was 21 and over, though, <laughs> you could put it into a, a cannon, into a t-shirt cannon, and like shoot it out into the crowd. That would be legit, yeah. as long as everyone here was 21. But Doesn't that sound fun? Nothing in kind. So don't try to set up some complicated nonsense. I don't believe some lawyer tells you this, that it's a complicated nonsense where you know, you're, uh, um, you know, you're, you're gonna be able to exchange for some sort of donation or you know, provide them some other thing in kind, you know, as long as they, uh, you know, no. It truly is just gonna be gifting it until they have to go to the light, they stay licensed to do that and proper land use at the local level to do that as well. So besides lawyers, what's the most expensive part of this business? Oh man, I mean. Besides lawyers. Expensive? I don't. I, would, I mean, our guest architects at this point are killing it because you know if you can draw a picture, if you can draw a fancy picture about what your weed room is going to look like, a city councilor is going to you know stamp it and allow you to do it. Um, security experts also. Every ex cop in the world who spent the last couple of decades busting down grow rooms is now has a really good idea of how to make them more secure. I've at this point now had three different cops work for me. They're it's so cool. They're the best, actually. I mean, it's the nice so thing, cool. The nice, I'll say, the nice thing about ex-cops not working for us is if you act, when you call, tell them I need a security plan for the city, here's the ordinance, and I need it by this time, they act. They they send it to you on time. Deadlines. No. And they will pass muster. So I guess uh, right now I've been looking at real estate costs in the city of Long Beach. Um, I've been looking at some properties in it. You're you're looking right around three dollars a square foot on property that actually has a value I'd say of about sixty five cents a square foot. Um, so you're going on. So say you wanted to start a, a business that was refinishing Harleys, you could get that business, that exact property probably for 65, 75 cents a square foot. And now the moment that you tell them that you're marijuana, you just went to three dollars. And there's no gray area on that. They're not going to, they don't care. Um, now, one of the things that I've been trying to retrain everyone for so long, we were in a mindset of we have to own this real estate, right? Because otherwise you're going to get evicted and nobody wants to get evicted. So buy the property, find someone to buy. We're going to change, okay? This, this times they are changing for marijuana. I would rather take my million and a half dollars and invest it into my business and find a lease rate for three to five years in a smaller business so that I can get going, get my established business model, get my foot in, make sure that this is what I want to do before I dump an exorbitant purchase rate, okay? You're still going to get killed on the purchase. It doesn't matter. The moment that you, they find out that you're a marijuana and not a real estate company, they will still kill you on the purchase. So my professional opinion right now, and everyone says, oh, oh, I got this building for $2 million. I got this other building for $3 million. I say, go find something that you can lease for $3 a square foot. Get a five-year lease on it, a small business that you'll max out on in five years and hopefully move into a, a bigger location or buy your neighbor business, blow a wall out, expand. Um, I, would, I would highly recommend that rather than taking your first few million that you borrowed into a real estate investment because now we're finally getting licenses so this isn't going to be the same type of thing that we used to be in where we didn't have a piece of paper to say that we were allowed to be here. Your lease has to say marijuana on it. 
So in order for you to apply for a license, your lease has to be completely st stipulated into what it is that you're gonna do. So now you're protected as any VC of any business in the world, or the United States or California. But you're protected the same way that you would be if you were building Harleys. You're protected under all of the same regulations because they can't pull out the, oh, well, they're doing something illegal, I'm kicking them out. That, that's not happening anymore. That can't happen anymore. You will be protected. Just like we were saying before, we're finally getting a little leverage politically to say you can't do that. We're finally being treated like real business people now when it comes to leasing. So my professional opinion right now is if you've got three and a half, four million dollars to put in on a business, earmark 800,000 of that for a really high lease for a few years and spend the rest of the money on your business. Make your businesses compliant. Bring the right team. Train the right people from day one because the biggest thing that you're gonna get yourselves into trouble with here is the liability of your staff. That's the biggest risk that you guys have. Every one of you go, thinking about going into this business right now, I, you take it seriously. If you wanna be a business owner, you're going to make sure that you try to do everything you know, to the law, especially if you're waiting to the point of where it's legal before you even get in, right? Well, half the people that are going to be working for you are not going to be that way unless you teach them to be that way. More than half of them. This is a very, very new industry. So I would spend my money on bringing in the right people, the right team, the right training, the right products, product development, streamlining your processes, rather than purchasing real estate right now. That would be my one bit of professional advice to everybody. Um, again, my, my statement of what's the next most expensive after lawyers, it's usually the real estate in this space, but I, and, and you know, the dollar per square foot you're getting right now, you're still gonna get, you're, you're gonna get hosed, and that's the truth. Um, and it'll be a little while before you're, we're not getting hosed anymore on our real estate costs. But big picture, we're finally getting protected. Like lawyers can't go to bat for you over your leases now. Before, when you didn't have a, a your lease, your lease said like holistic herbal center or like homeopathic medicine, right? That's what I, I, I know. One of you guys has a lease out there that says like herbal center or like holistic medicine or like ooh, somebody probably had a massage I bet somebody had a massage place that turned into selling cannabis as well but now you're actually gonna have a lease that says what you're supposed to have so you're gonna have a level of protection that's gonna be able to save money for you in the long run um, and then what would you say is the first step to getting licensed getting that property you know the uh, uh, finding a client property and at this point is the first step and all I'm, all your restaurant team is going to be doing is glorified homework you know it's going to be presenting the information that what your business is going to look like to the proper authorities you know so find find property that makes sense to the type of business activity that you're going to be doing um, and if you're really lucky it's in a place where it's actually legal to do so so you don't have to then convince them to, to create that legal life avenue um, just expect that if those things happen to align somebody's probably already found out beforehand and therefore and as many uh, as often as you can try to get an option on your property yes. before you actually secure it on licensing uh, I think that's a, one of the biggest issues I've seen people will put the cart before the horse and close on a lease when they don't have a license that will legally protect you from a criminal book criminally and sit in and put it right there just purely financial plan form it will protect your assets purely the, the way talk to I me mean, obviously talk to experience when uh, uh, real estate attorneys are doing this, but if you are doing what is essentially land speculation, which is going into an area or jurisdiction where this is not legal and purchasing from, and under a moratorium, in purchasing or renting land with the idea that eventually or very soon that that area is going to be properly, you know, it is going to be proper for that. You know, that's one way of doing it, saying, well, well this, this tract, of, this warehouse in the middle of nowhere that's around, you know, miles away from any, from any school, from any park, from any other sensitive use, Perfect cannabis manufacturing is just not legal there right now. Well, obviously that means you can't operate, and nor should you. You shouldn't do anything for it. But if you want to secure and make sure that that land, that eventually is going to be properly for it, make sure you, you condition the lease with the with the firm understanding that you're going to be doing that sort of activity there in the future, provided that it's legal to do so. But in the meantime, you're you know taking a little bit of risk, paying for it, and you know thinking and holding on to it for eventual for that eventual use. And you can construct contracts to do that that are completely above board. All right, I think that's wrapping up our time. Do you guys have any questions for us?
there, there are some uh, jurisdictions that when I'm just going to find out what their Kansas law is like, you find that old paraphernalia um, uh, ban on there. And uh, generally, I mean, it's, and again, this is not to encourage anybody to go into that business, but obviously the ancillary businesses in a, in a gold rush really do better than the actual primary business. And so, you know, I would, and in this case, it seems like even in those jurisdictions that do have paraphernalia laws on the books, no one seems to be really enforcing them particularly strenuously because I'm going into every single 7 Eleven or anywhere else, and it seems like they're starting to sell things like a couple of years ago. I mean, are being now explicitly labeled as for cannabis use. And that's one of the things now with adult use on, you know, we might not have access directly to the product, but with adult use changing the laws of saying that what is now cannabis, what cannabis used to be contraband, unless you had a medical recommendation, now it is actually legal to possess it as long as over 21, that changes ancillary laws. So in this case, it's not contraband to have parapet to have a glass pipe. You know, now that that's actually, you know, for not only just a potential medical device, a good argument, but it's just legal to have. <laughs> Um, you'll, you might be seeing even those places where it is being enforced, you know, the, the ban against you know, water pipes falling forward because now the legal the legal basis for them that's existed the last couple of decades is, 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 is no longer there. So yeah, I call them bongs in Colorado. Yeah. So if, if you have a question about that and you're getting a job from the city, that's something call it for lawyer. They might have a little bit of fun challenging and overturning a now outdated law. Back there, no, right? Yeah. Insurance isn't super easy. It comes in early on. You need to have, most cities are gonna require you to have a policy before you, you apply. The workers city of Long Beach, policy. for instance, is off. You have to have a policy as a part of it. Uh, workers' comp is an, is an easy one. There's a few companies that are doing workers' comp. Products liability is probably one of the most difficult for you to get. Um, probably one of the more important um, and also probably one of the most difficult to uphold in a court of law as well for marijuana specifically. Um, there's a few companies that are offering it. I'm legally not allowed to give advice on what insurance company, but there are some marijuana companies that are moving to California. Um, he probably could give some some better uh, insight to who, maybe, but I, I, there are some and it is a pain in the butt, but you can get it. and. Every city is going to require that you have it to apply. Yeah. That's like the elephant in every room yeah. that we're in. Um, I mean, uh, well, do we think the federal government will try to overturn what's happening? They, I personally don't think so. I'm, really I'm gambling on 2022. Really, they really, really want to, yeah. but um, some things are happening in our favor. It's a, some things are happening in our favor um, in the sense that they, they tried to go the above board administrative route and promote and have this whole task force to be able to provide the recommendations and basically they stacked the, the uh, they stacked the, the, this task force to make sure that it would, would come out with the, the recommendation to overturn this Obama policy because it's not being done again any this is not the, the any federal interdiction would not be coming because of it's not working it is it's just that it would be a purely, almost entirely out of political spite on behalf of the Trump administration. And what they're finding out is that the public, any of the public desire to actually do that is gone away. And now, you know, 65% nationally, people advocating for full legalization. That's an important number to realize. That's far beyond the tipping point for promoting more, most legislation. I mean, we're polling above single pair of healthcare. So, is that a fight they want to have? I mean, it seems like in California, the, the Attorney General's office is, seen, is ready and wearing to go for a fight with, over federalism issues over this and sanctuary bills and a host of other issues that the federal government is trying to do. So, do they want to? Absolutely. And they're going to be looking for an excuse to. So, from the offer standpoint, do not travel with cannabis across state lines. No. Do not sell cannabis across state lines. Do not interdict cannabis to anybody under the age of 18 nope. in, a, in a legal jurisdiction to do so. Keep your nose incredibly clean. Declare every single piece of cash that you get. Keep your, declare every single piece of cash that you get. You know, because you're going to have to be incredibly perfect for the next couple of years to avoid. Incredibly you know, perfect. Yeah, to avoid the, they're, they're looking, they're looking for a test case. Don't be that person. <laughs> I'm gambling on 2022 for legalization. I've got a bunch of money out there on bets. If anybody else wants to bet me, I'd be willing to take that gamble as well. Uh, the Democrats weren't stupid. They would actually take it up as a 
as a, a part of the issue. As, a, as an issue, because yeah. it, it's one of those things, and this is something to remember too when you're talking to your local legislators, it's, it brings out voters. It's not a very popular issue, it gets attention automatically. So if it's on the ballot in any sort of manner, it's, you know, it's gonna draw a lot of attention and remind people of that going forward that they're probably less popular than, than Proposition 64 was in the last election. Just tell them, you know, look. Well, how many, how many people voted for you in 2012, or in 2016? More than likely marijuana, I'll hold you. Most people are less popular than we, <laughs> most people. All right, well, I think that's it for us. Any other questions? Oh, one more. Talk to a local humble attorney. That's every, I, I'm an expert on, on Southern California po on politics, but yeah, whenever somebody asks me a question about that, if I know somebody, I'll try to say, go talk to so-and-so. Humboldt's one of those places, I would say, um, California Growers Association has pretty good coverage of the small farmers out there. Uh, CSEIA you know, has been representing the retailers who supply, who, who you know, rely on them for a while. But ask around for the current operators in there, who they trust as a, you know, uh, uh, in terms of their, their little, little political ecosystem because I am an outsider, I don't know it. Thank you guys, thank you so much for coming out. Yes ma'am.